Welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining us tonight for our event Bonding with the Audience, an interview with playwright and novelist Kia Korthren and with our host Tatiana Anderson. I'm gonna do a quick bio for both of our guests today, but you can find a much more detailed bio on our website. Kia Korthren is a playwright and novelist. She was the 2017 resident playwright of Chicago's Eclipse Theater, which produced three of her plays, including the premiere of Megastasis. Her second novel, Moon and the Mars, was praised by the Wall Street Journal and the Irish Times, and her debut novel, The Castle Cross and the Magnet Carter, was a New York Times book review editor's choice and the winner of the Center for Fiction First Novel Prize. She serves on the Dram Drama Dramatists Guild Council, is a new dramatist alumnus, and a member of the Authors Guild. Kia grew up in Cumberland, Maryland, graduated from the University of Maryland College Park, received her MFA from Columbia University, and currently lives in New York City. Our host, Tatiana Anderson, is a two-time Emmy nominee and host for Comcast National Public Affairs Program, newsmakers that can be seen on TV stations across the country. She holds a master's degree from Columbia University and did her undergraduate work at Fisk University. As part of her philosophy on the importance of giving back, she serves as the National Board Secretary for Easter Seals, an organization that has focused for over 100 years on providing care, access, and equity to those living with disabilities. Tatiana heads her own communications company, Brown Paper Bag Media, as well as a production company, Starfield Media. She hails from the great state of Michigan, but calls Washington, D.C. home. And with that, I will turn it over to Tatiana to get our conversation started today. Thank you, everyone, for being here. And Kia, thank you most of all for being here. Um, we've got an exciting conversation ahead. And I really want to start out um, with a little sort of scene setter of, of who you are, you know, where you grew up, how that informed um, what you've become today. Yeah, I was actually born in Maryland, in, in way out in Western Maryland, Cumberland, Maryland, where I could, it's like a 10 minute walk to West Virginia from my house. And um, uh, yeah, and I um, went to I, the first couple of years to a small college outside of there, Frostburg, and then the last two years I graduated from the University of Maryland College Park. I actually lived in the D.C. area a few years before I, I then went to grad school at Columbia for theater arts. So I want to fast forward to Columbia. I mean, how did that experience inform what you later became, which which was a playwright? And I wonder, did you get out of the Columbia experience, you know, what you thought you would? Was it everything you needed? Um, tell us a little bit about, about how that went for you. Yeah, well... Um... Uh, quite frankly, the the best thing about Columbia was it got me to New York because because I'm a playwright and that's you know the best place to be in the in the U.S. And so um, did I get out of it? I mean, it's you know it's it's a little hard because the the program has changed so much since I was there. So whatever I were to say about it has nothing to do with what it is now. Um, for me, because when uh, I had always studied writing different forms, uh, but it wasn't until my last semester in undergrad at University of Maryland that I took a playwriting class. One of my very few Black teachers, and she was incredible in many, many ways, and um, and that led to me becoming a playwright. Um, so at that time, there was a lot of what they call crew work in, in, uh, in the theater department. For me, because I wasn't a theater, um, it wasn't my undergrad degree, I I did like crew work because I learned a lot, um, probably a little too much crew work at that time that I was there, when some of us writers were having time to, you know, to find time to write. It was actually because of all the crew work. I sincerely doubt that's true anymore, but um but as I said, yeah, I learned a lot of the about being a theater artist there. And I, yeah, and I came to New York where I've uh, lived ever since. Growing up, I never would have thought I was would end up in New York because I grew up in a small town and it was just so foreign. Um, so, yeah. yeah. 
bright lights, big cities. They already always attract <laughs> everybody, right? And it caught you and kept you. And and thankfully, because that's where you have done your your best work, is the energy of that city. You translate that onto the page of what you do. Um, and you obviously currently have a show um, at Arena Stage, which is right down the street from where I'm speaking to everybody. It's called Tempestuous Elements, and it's running until March 17th. If there's anyone here who has not seen it, you still have a chance to go um, and, and check that out. Several people who are in the audience did actually go on the 21st to see the show um, to rave reviews. Absolutely wonderful. Um, but what made you want to craft a play about Anna Julia Cooper? Okay, so um, I actually, all day before this reading up until six o'clock, I was in rehearsal for a play in New York called Fish. I think, can you see it? I, I can see it. Um, which is about the contemporary public school system. And while I was researching that, I came across Anna Julia Cooper, this incredible educator, um, DC based. So then I got a commission for Arena Stage. And it was such a DC story that um, that I suggested that I would write about that. They thought it was a great idea. Funny thing, many, 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 many years ago, like decades ago, I read a book by Paula Giddings, Giddings called Where and When I Enter, which is which is about it's a sort of a black women's history book. Um and where and when I enter is a quote from Anna Julia Cooper. So I obviously came across her decades ago and just sort of forgot and then came across her again. And by completely strange coincidence, these two shows about education and focusing on Black education are back to back, you know, 100 years apart, the settings. Um, which has a lot to do with the pandemic. The show, uh, the arena show would have happened two years ago if things didn't go slowly after the pandemic. So. so tell us a little bit about who she was for those who weren't at the show yeah. and her contributions to Black education, specifically in the Washington, D.C. area, were so important at the time. Yeah, Anna Julia Cooper was, um, she's like this incredible historical figure that everybody should know about, and very few people do. Um she, um, so she was born into South Carolinian slavery um, in Raleigh. So it was urban slavery actually, but, uh, but she was a child when emancipation came. So she remembers slavery more in terms of her mother, her older brothers, less so about herself. Um, I think she was about nine or something. Um, her mother very much believed in education, immediately sent her to school. Um, she was, she went to um, St. Augustine's, um, you know, she read all these books in the original Latin and Greek and, um, and old Greek and, and then went to um, Oberlin College and uh, then grad school. Um, uh, so, so when she came to DC, she was teaching classical languages, Latin, and I believe Greek too, uh, because she was very fluent. She read all these books. Actually, her specialty was math. That was that she was most brilliant at, among all the things that she was brilliant about. So she taught for 20 years at the M Street School, eventually becoming... So the M Street School in D.C. was, it was a Black school at that time. It essentially became like a prep school because uh, this classical education, um, a lot of the kids went to colleges that accepted Black students at that time. Um, and uh, yeah, so she was there for like 20 years. Then she left for a few years and then came back as a teacher again, which is a, a whole other thing. And, and then lived uh, the rest of her life in DC. She lived to be 105 years old. So when she was 67, she got her PhD at, from the Sorbonne um in Paris so um and she had like 40 years left in her still after that right um but it became sort of the crux of the story um are uh the end of her 20 years in DC which is around uh 1906 and uh it became very controversial because she really insisted on teaching this black classical education. There was another school set up for um, Armstrong, it was called, called, and it was vocational arts, and she had set that up. Um, 
but it became a time as often was happening at that time when a lot of the powers that be decided that a black education um, should be the trades and not the classics that you know black kids should not be going into law or medicine but they should be farmers or seamstresses and so that became the big struggle and the big conflict of the play. Um, W.E. Du Bois appears as a character in the play and um, Booker T. Washington is very much referenced in the play. And a lot of folks know this controversy between Du Bois and, um, and Washington, uh, Washington being the one supporting trades and Du Bois um, um, sort of intellectual pursuits. Um, but but Anna Cooper was a colleague of Du Bois and a few years older, at least a decade older than, than Du Bois. So she was actually in this struggle while he was still in, you know, a kid coming up in college. And so um, so yeah, she's somebody that everyone should know. She actually is the only woman quoted on the American passport, but you know, that's uh that's all the people know about her, if that, you know, if they even notice that. It's the, it's the page with the Statue of Liberty if you want to check out your passports. I had no idea, and I'm going to check out my passport. So that <laughs> schism within, you said, you know, among the powers that be about how Black people should be educated, but there was that same schism within the Black community, obviously. How did you decide how to let that play out on stage? Yes. So, um, and, and I should say as an autobiography, I'm sorry, as a biographical play, I really, there, there are um, fictional characters, but I really wanted to, to stick with facts. So there's a fictional character, a teacher at the school named Minerva. Um, I made her up, but um, there, there actually were teachers like Minerva um, who were favored by the Board of Education because um, because they, um, I, I was going to say they, they went against her. The character that I write is not somebody that's wants, she wants the same things as Anna. She just sees it in a different way. So for her, um, something like, um, she gets very angry about a student who to her mind comes late all the time. She can't come late about once a month, you know, to school. Um, but to her, from her point of view, um, uh, as black students in this society, we can't afford to make mistakes. And so, so I don't write her. So she ultimately does become an antagonist. Um, as I told the actress, who's quite wonderful, the opening night cards is that she's an antagonist but not a villain because it's just, she sees it in a different way. And there were teachers that um, if they in any way um, said anything negative about Anna, you know, in any, to any degree that could be favored by the board of education. So, so she's sort of an amalgamation of that sort of thing. But again, I didn't want, it was less interesting to me to write a character who's, um, who, who would be the opposite and would be completely a Booker T person. Um, that was much less interesting to me than the nuance of both these women wanting the best for Black education, wanting the best um, for classical education, but what happens with them going uh, in different directions. And then there's another character. He's um, There are 11 actors in the cast and he's the only white uh, actor. His name's um, Paul wonderful actor. So he plays the director who was a real person, director Hughes at the board of education and they um, knocked heads. She, uh, he and Anna. How difficult was it for you to come to this level of success? I mean, being an artist is, is non-traditional. It's, it's not easy. Um, what sort of struggles have you faced along the way to get to where you are? And, and would you have made any different choices along that path? Well, um, no, no, I would not have. The struggles are probably financial, you know, it's, um, I could have, 
I, I absolutely could have made the choice to go more into TV. I mean, there were a couple of moments early in my career when things, like I did an episode of The Wire, for example. So it's sort of things like that that fell into my lap. And, and it's fun because it's different than what I usually do. But what I really wanted um, with my life was to do theater um, and, and in recent years, novels to write fiction. And so... Um, uh, living cheap in that way has allowed me not only the, the time uh, to write, but also uh, just in itself, but also I've gone to many um, writing retreats, artist retreats um, uh, outside of the country, some of them, several in Europe. And, um, and just like going away for a month and focusing on my writing, which I would not be able to do if I took a more lucrative job that um, in TV, or for that matter, um, I could have been, a, you know, I'd had opportunities to be a college professor and I'd done a little, again, I would do like a gig here and there, but I wasn't, I didn't really want to commit to a sort of um, tenure track mm -hmm. uh, situation, partly because um I think I'm a good teacher. And, and when I've done it, I really focus to the point of me not writing my own stuff at all. And so um, it was sort of this choice. Once in a while, sure, but but it's something that I knew if I wanted to continue being an, an artist, I couldn't really do it full time. Um, I taught briefly as a journalism professor at the American University in Cairo, and it was one of the hardest jobs ever mm. teaching for me. Highly rewarding, but I was like, this is just, this is too much work and too much responsibility. So I appreciate what you're saying. Um, and on that note, you mentioned um, your travel. Um, mm -hmm. So I want to sort of switch gears. We don't really see it in your bio. You don't have too much of an international bent yet. And still, you've done some pretty impressive things overseas, especially in the Middle East. I want to ask you about a project you did called um, Imagine Yemen. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that work and, 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 and how you even got to that. Yeah. Um, okay. So I could take it all the way back to 2001. Um, a friend of mine, Naomi Wallace, who is a, um, a very renowned playwright, I'm saying a friend of mine, actually, this is how we became friends way back in uh, 2001, she put in, um, she, she had this dream of having a bunch of playwrights write short pieces about how um, Iraqis were suffering under U.S. sanctions. That was called Imagine Iraq. And um and we did sort of readings of it, I think, um, was it that spring or something? But when we when we were actually going to do the readings and they were, um, yeah, just these short pieces, like about 10 or 11 of them for one evening. Um, it was November. And by that point, 9-11 had just happened. And suddenly all these theaters that were, were going to house it suddenly like close their doors. But we ended up getting at the um, Cooper Union, which in New York, which is, is an amazing place. It has this amazing history. So it's kind of the best place. Um, <clears throat> having met Naomi, then a year later, September of 2002, she had always had this dream of bringing several playwrights to Palestine. So there were six of us. Um, the, the most famous was Tony Kushner of Angels in America. And um, and yeah, so the six of us went there a week in Palestine, um, mostly on the West Bank and in um, uh, Jerusalem, a little Israel proper. But one day we did go to Gaza. Um, and it was an incredible, incredible, incredible. It's one of those trips, you know, it's hard to believe it's 22 years ago now, but how things are so vivid because it's so stayed with me. And I still have friends um, from there, um, uh, mostly on the West Bank. Um, and 
which is very, very tough, especially. So, now. Yeah. I mean, before I get to my next question, let me remind the audience that we would love to hear from you as well. So if you have uh, questions, pop them into the chat. I see a couple here and I'll be getting to them a little bit later, but we do want to hear from you and Kia does want to answer your questions. But while we're on the topic of um, what's going on in Israel um, and, and, the, and the whole Gaza situation, given those memories of your time there were so vivid, what are your thoughts about what we are all witnessing today? Genocide. I mean, in in, in, in a word, I mean, it's, um, you know, what happened on October 7th, which, which many people bring up was, um, you know, it was, uh, in terms of what Hamas did to Israeli citizens was um, horrific, was war crimes, um, was not out of the blue, was not, um, was not um, unprovoked. It was very much provoked. I mean, it was horrible, but history didn't start there. I mean, we can go back to, you know, 1947 and before, all in 1948 and all that, but, um, but even that year, I mean, I think anybody who's paid attention to what's been going on in Palestine and Israel over the last couple of years, Israel has elected the most right wing government that, you know, in the last year or two that it's ever had, it became this coalition government. So Netanyahu, um, who was pretty to the right himself, I mean, these are people beyond way out there. And so he also has a lot of legal troubles. If he were to end the war, those would come down on him. He probably would be out of the office and maybe in prison, you know. Um, so there's all that. But but anyway, up until October 7th, because of this right-wing government, which is very supportive of West um, uh, settlers on the West Bank, um, more Palestinian children had been killed that year um, by the IDF and 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 settlers, I too believe, um, than had been in many years, I, maybe forever. I'm not quite sure. Um, so yes, so when that you know horrible thing happened on October seventh, um, you know it's interesting because there was this sense of quiet in the Middle East and. What governments in the West mean by quiet is that it's the regular or maybe a little more um, abuse um, and killings of Palestinians, but that doesn't hit the news. It only hits the news when, when Hamas does something to Israel. So it wasn't quiet at all for Palestinians. Um, yeah, yeah. Shall we get back to imagining? Well, I I, I, I was going to just ask you again about <laughs> Yemen because you know that that story really does address the catastrophe um, mm -hmm. in Yemen um, because of the U.S. responsibility there. So I wanted you to talk a little bit about that. But but against that, does what's going on? Well, let let me get to that the first part first. Talk to us a little bit uh, about the actual production of of Imagine Yemen, and I'll. Yeah. Yeah. So somebody, another playwright had asked me, so when was that? Was it 2017 or it's funny, it was that long ago, either, or was it 2018? I think it was 2017, um, either 27, 2018. Anyway, um, when, I mean, for a long time, it was, you know, before, you know, what's going on in Gaza now, it was kind of, it was the place in the world um, where uh, there were more killings than uh, than any other place of civilians. And that was coming from the Saudis uh, with weapons from the U.S. And um, and uh, so we, uh, a playwright contacted me and said, what can we do about this? And, um, and quite frankly, um, at the time, because I never really produced anything before, I, I was like, gulp right because because I thought it was horrible but it was like oh now to do something and, and by the way I've never been to, to Yemen but I was horrified by what's going there so I dragged Naomi into it again and um and we called it Imagine uh Yemen and uh and yeah we did nine short pieces 
mine, by the way, I I, I actually um should have should have sent this to you, Tatiana. I didn't I didn't think of it, but um I I made a little musical and and later we animated it and it's like five minutes on YouTube. I should have sent it to you, but um, I can send it to you later. But um, yeah, yeah. But uh, so I made up this whole song about the the history and what led to, you know, to the present, um, to, to that present 2017. But now, I mean, I mentioned the Houthis in it, but now there's a whole other story with the Houthis and how They've been supporting Palestine by um, or Gaza, you know, by by not letting in ships um, that that you know of people that are you know Israeli, U.S., um, U.K. You know, it wasn't anything violent. All they were saying was that we're not going to let these ships go through. And they were, the response was violence, you know, basically they were doing an economic protest and the response from the U.S. was let's bomb them. So, um, are you creatively sparked by what you see happening in the region today? I mean, is this going to beg another part of, of, of writing for you in a, in, a, in another play? Um, well, I mean, as I said, I've done short plays. Um, I've, I, I mean, I've been wanting to do something. I did a short play a long time ago, but I've been wanting to do a longer play actually about Guantanamo and how that, you know, that um, because, I mean, I could certainly write something. And I, and actually one of my friends there on the, um, the West Bank is a poet and I'm going to do helping with editing some of his poetry. Um, how much I put it into my writing um, beyond the short plays, I still have to think about because um, I, I feel like a Palestinian should be the person to tell that story. Um, I am happy to reference it in my work, and I have. Um, I made a reference um, to settlers and Palestine in a play of mine with all black characters um, that have to do with water and uh, water uh, scarcity and, and things. So it was a completely different subject, but I threw in a little line about that. <laughs> in terms of doing a whole play, I'm not sure if I have the authority to that because there are some you know wonderful Palestinian writers, but I certainly make references to it sometimes. <laughs> How, you know, that's a, a a real thing in the artist community, you know, um, who controls narratives and who should tell other people's stories. I mean, what are your thoughts um, about that very idea? I mean, should Black people just be telling Black people's stories? Should European people just be telling European stories? Or is there value there to looking at things through a different lens? How do you feel about that as a Black woman, as an artist? Yeah, no, I actually wrote an article about it um uh, good 10 years ago and then I collected like the opinions of like 19 other playwrights it was done in um in a playwrights magazine I called it the ethics of ethnic and it was all about you know whether you could do that and like everybody seemed to say that you could I mean I I feel like you can write any story but you've got to um if it's going to be outside of your community, you've got to respect that community enough to um, talk to that community, address that community, and um, accept that you're going to be criticized by that community, um, uh, by some of that community. Um, but I don't believe, uh, I believe you can write any story. I mean, in my novel, um, the second novel, um, which takes place it has to do with black and Irish relationships leading in New York City, leading to the Civil War. Um, there is um, Ellen Nape girl, a native girl. And I, so I did write her, but um, I found a, a Lenape person to read those sections. Um, yeah, to tell me if I went wrong in any place. And, um, and um, yeah, it, it was great to hear what he had to say. And I'm sure another Lenape person would say, you got it all wrong, you know? Um, it, but it wasn't the whole story, but it was part of the story. And it was really important to me that 
not to ignore that part of the story. That it, it actually that time that book runs from 1857 to 1863, and then with an epilogue. And it's in New York, but it was at the time. When would that have been? 1862, when there were, I think, thir hangings of 38 Lakota in, um, in was it Minnesota? Uh, Montana, no, Montana. Um, it was, yeah, yeah, because there were, you know, the so-called Indian Wars. And um, yeah, they, they hanged, at, all at once, 38 men. And it was interesting because apparently, I didn't know about this, but there were these um, memes going around a couple of years before I started researching for the book um, that apparently were blaming Lincoln because it was um, under his administration that that happened. It's actually more complicated than that because they... Um, they had given him like 300 names and they just wanted to, the, the um, Montanans. And they, I'm going to be embarrassed if it's Minnesota. It's one of those M names. M Gates, Michigan, yes. Montana, okay. Minnesota. Pick the one you like. Yeah. Yes. Um, um, but the white folks there, um, it was like th more than 300. And the trials would go on. Some of the trials were like five minutes in English and the person didn't even understand English. So it was beyond a kangaroo court, right? But at that time, Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln, who was a lawyer, it, it so happened that something had just gone through where I guess these were uh, military um, trials. And so he had to set, sign off on any executions. And he actually, of the 300 and some, and they were really uh, bloodthirsty, the, the white people there. Um, you know, it was crowds that showed up for this big, it was like like a square um, and ropes hanging all along this square. All at the same time, they, they, they hanged them. Um, they wanted more than 300. And they were basically sort of saying that um, if you don't sign off on all of these, we're gonna kill every native, you know, man, woman and child, right? So they're sort of threatening this. Nonetheless, Lincoln went carefully through every single one. He only came up with two, who I think were maybe also accused of rape, whether that's even true, but he knew they were too bloodthirsty, two would not be enough. So it went down from like 300 something to 38. So on the one hand, um, he, actually the 39th one was this elder, which goes to show how much Probably so many people were innocent anyway, you know. And also when you talk about innocence, it's a war. It's like, it's not about, um, you know, they were fighting back from people on their land. So on the one hand, he, you could say he saved a couple of hundred lives. On the other hand, he was the one who signed off on, on um, giving the land away, you know, to to settlers and so and on the railroads coming through both of those and so he's the one that caused the infringement on the native land so so yeah it's, it was complicated so we have um several questions from audience members and one of them is uh saying that you are a master storyteller so um <laughs> i, I want to get you that compliment but um, this question has to do with the production that's at Arena Stage now. Um, can you share how you were selected to create um, and work with Arena Stage? And, and how did you research um, your protagonist's relationship with the people around her and the other stakeholders interwoven into the play? Yeah, well, I've been doing theater a long time. I mean, I've had a lot of productions in New York and across the country. I had the Royal Court Theater in London, a play had premiered there. So it's just partly I'm sort of a, a, a playwright that was on their radar and they really liked my work. Usually with commissions, um, if the theater likes your work, they will commission you. They won't tell you you have to write about anything particular. They don't have to produce it if they don't, they decide not to, but they usually don't have a stipulation. 
what you write about. Um, and yeah, so I got this commission and it was part of this program that was going on of sort of history plays. Molly Smith, the former artistic director, um, had this idea of starting at 1776. I think she's going to commission, I guess, like, how's that add up? Like 25 playwrights or something, but to have a story from like every decade, um, American decade from then to the present. And um, mine was slightly cheating because um, my story takes place in 1905 to 06. And that decade was already taken. But something that I forgot to say, which is really important about Anna, is that she was this amazing feminist of her time. And so she had released a book in 1892, I think it was. So we so we went with that as my decade because that decade was still free, um, called A Voice from the South. And it was, because she was also a speaker. She was an activist. She was... Um, yeah, yeah, just this premier intellectual of the time. And, um, and so it was a collection of her writings. And if you look for it, and by the way, you can, if you look up Anna Julia Cooper, A Voice from the South, it's, it's available like Gutenberg, like you can get it free online, the text. And most of it is about, um, women's equality and black women's equality. And so she was very much in terms of, uh, the struggle for black rights and also the struggle, um, as women's rights, especially women as intellectuals. Uh, she very much put them on the same level as men. Um, the M street school at that time had, um, like 130 men and, oh, sorry, 130 boys and 400 girls. I mean, I think, uh, because of, um, maybe, uh, for, for whatever reason, maybe it was a cultural thing that the young men had to go to work, but the girls could still go to school, but it was overwhelmingly young women. Another audience member wants to ask about that time, um, um compared to, the, to today and, and wondering if you see parallel struggles with black education today as mm -hmm. there were during the time of Anna Julia Cooper. Yeah, well, I, you know, it's interesting because uh, when I was there last summer, we were workshopping the play and the, um, I met the the set designer and the lighting designer. By the way, the design was incredible. I, I feel like I, I believe anyone who went to the play would say, I, I, I have such admiration and gratitude for all the work that the, the, the set, the lighting, the costumes, the choreography, um, original music the sound designer had made. And so I am so grateful for all the work they put into it. Um, but they were asking me, it was the set and lighting designer, um, how I felt this play had anything to do with the present uh, education system. And I remember I was a little surprised at first they were asking that and I was like, well, and I had a whole lot to say because of because of Fish, the play that's going to be done in New York that we're in rehearsal for now. Um, I mean, I think there are um, there are different struggles, but there are also um, uh, like well, okay, so there are struggles, for example, with um, there's a problem in the public school system that some people would say with a lack of economic diversity. So, um, I mean, there's definitely racial diversity, that's one thing, but economic diversity would mean that in a public school, um, you're going to have some uh, struggling parents who have to work three jobs and just do not have the time to come down and make sure that things are going well to school, much as they would love to. If in that same school, there are some privileged parents, they can do it, you know, they can come down and do that. And so one of the issues is if everybody's poor in the school, it is unlikely that things are going to work well in terms of the parents being a part of it, which often really helps because they're the ones really struggling for their children. There's issues of charter schools today, which, um, run the gamut in terms of quality, but even when we talk about the best ones, they're getting public and private money, and it's a 
it's a uh, lottery system. So in, in New York in particular, I don't think it's the only place, but certainly in New York, there uh, it's an issue of real estate. So the charter school will be put on like the top floor, like they'll just take the entire top floor of a regular public school and turn it into this charter school. And so all the other students in the school see, oh, those are the really worthy students because they've got the computers, they've got all this up there and we've got, you know, peeling paint and, you know, we sit in test prep. We're not even having real classes because we just have to learn to fill in bubbles. And um, so it's a different kind of um, I, inequality that goes on today. And then you talk about racial inequality because um, the uh, today the, the most segregated school system in the country, the, the state is New York State in terms of black students, um, California in terms of Latino students because Brown versus the Board of Ed desegregated the South, but it didn't do anything about the North. And so there's de facto desegregation because of um, uh, housing discrimination. And um, I see you where you're, touching, you're touching on these themes of, of class and race. And another audience member has a question about that. Um, it says, considering your play, uh, Tempestuous Elements, how do you compare class discrimination as being the main issue affecting African-American social mobility as opposed to racial discrimination? In, in that play or in, in general? Well, it says, considering your play, Tempestuous Elements. So I'm guessing yeah. that that's where the question focuses. Yeah, I mean, in Tempestuous Elements, there's this issue that Anna struggles with of is she an elitist? And it's sort of, um, W.B. Du Bois is a character in the play, I think I already said that. And um, I mean, that was an issue with him, right? He had the, the talented temp and what did that mean? And um, I, so as, as I um, presented it in the play, so, so her concern of being elitist, she, Absolutely, that that would all be in terms of intellect, not in terms of finance, because um, she was never a rich woman. I mean, she was born into slavery. Everything that she got was from scholarships. Um, and so and so, yes, it became a question of, as she says to one of the students um, at some point who wants to transfer to the um, uh he wants he wants to transfer to the, the school for trades. She's trying to discourage him, um, but he really he feels like he can't keep up in, in this school. And um, and she ultimately lets him go. But she does say that, you know, when we live in a world where I'm paraphrasing myself now, but that um, uh, patients, um, black patients are left to die because we don't have black doctors and you know white hospitals won't take them or um, black defendants are sentenced to die because we don't have black lawyers and it's just you know they could be innocent and how it is important to have all of that that we have um, our workers as well as our intellects that you know that we should be part of all that there is a chapter I mean I'm sorry a um a uh, scene that deals with this women's club. Um, and there are all these famous women activists. Uh, Mary Church Terrell is, is in this. And that comes up a bit with class because there was um, an issue of Anna and Mary having parallel lives being at oh, uh, Oberlin at the same time. But Mary, um, being very tied in with her husband to the political scene of DC and how she sort of struggles for the race in a way that seems a little more accom politically accommodating. Um, and Anna's is a little more radical. And so then that becomes a different class struggle. I feel like another I audience. Know, I don't know if I answered the question, but if well, I <laughs> <laughs> it was very comprehensive. So thank you for that. <laughs> Um, another audience member is asking about your creative process and whether or not you have a typical creative process. Um, do you always get inspiration from actual tragedies or or events in general? 
Yeah, well, I definitely always, I, you know, there was a time when I used to say I write politically, but then I realized more accurately it would be to say that I write, I always write about social, um, uh, social justice issues. Um, the reason political is inaccurate is because somebody writing right wing or somebody writing apolitically would be, that's a type of political writing. So, but, but yeah, it's always social justice. So um, I've written about abortion, reproductive rights. I've written I've, uh, several of my, I wrote a play about a girl's gang in New York. That was maybe my most prominent play. Um, I've written several that take place in prison. I have spent, you know, a bit of time teaching writing in prisons and one of them's a women's prison. One of them's, um, it's actually like scenes from the girl gangs play. One, one takes place on death row and I was addressing the death penalty in that play. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. I actually have a play now that hasn't been produced yet, um, but it has to do with workers' rights. I mean, I did one a long time ago with workers' rights um, in a factory, but this has to do with sort of contemporary workers' rights where the central character is a Walmart worker, a Black woman oh. worker. And um, which was a play I started like 15 years ago, but then recently updated it because there was a public reading of it because so much had happened since 15 years ago. There was there was the fight for 15, there was Occupy Wall Street, there's um, the pandemic, you know, all that stuff has happened. And I actually have a scene towards the end, um, sort of a dream scene, a, a dream scene with um, <laughs> Jeff Bezos flying in a spacesuit. you know, it's just- uh, <laughs> Love, want to see that one. <laughs> um, another audience member is asking how your upbringing in Appalachia contributed to your activism and also to your your writings. Um, your family has a, a, a long history in in Appalachia. Yeah? Well, my mom's family, my mom's family, uh, all grew up in that area for, a, a, as far as I know, a couple of generations. I don't know that far back, but at least like to my great grandmother. My father grew up on a farm in Virginia, and um, I, yeah, which I actually went to. I hadn't seen since I was a toddler, but I went to about a year and a half ago. Um, the land is still there; it's gone fallow, but it's you know still there. The house is falling down, but it's you know still there. Um, because actually, the novel I'm working now, my third novel, is going to have to do with several generations of black farmers. And so um, my dad didn't really talk about it much growing up, but but I talked to my you know my aunts and um, so uh, so yeah um, I think the the former play I wrote about right workers rights had a lot to do with that. It actually had to do with it was two men who worked in a factory. Um, so this was back in. It was produced in 98, so this was quite a while ago, um, but they were clandestinely lovers and they sort of become on opposite sides of this strike. Um, so that was definitely uh, sort of, you know, uh, informed from my upbringing. Uh, my first, uh, an early play that had to do with abortion um, takes place in we, we, we call them the Appalachian Mountains, but I know most people say Appalachian, but we call them Appalachians. Um, but yeah, it sort of takes place in that. And um, my first novel, I I mean, I grew up in Cumberland, Maryland, fictionalizes Cumberland. So it's very much, it's different, uh, it goes to different parts of the country, but one uh, part of the novel is called, it's a section called Humble Maryland, which is which is my fictionalization of uh, Cumberland in the in the time of my mother's time at that because it's like the the forties and um, so, but I've been living in New York a long time, so I have as much urban stuff, you know, the breath booms, a girls gang from the Bronx. I wrote a play about environmental racism that takes place in Harlem. Um, I yeah, yeah, and of course this uh this play, which is 
DC um, fish is I don't know yeah, well well uh, on fish you you've got back-to-back -back world premieres uh, coming up you have something next month I believe and I, I definitely want the audience to hear about that before we, we wrap this up yes yes so that's that <laughs> my, my my little ad my don't tell. <laughs> so that is about the contemporary uh public school system um it's a co-production between Keen Company and the Working Theater um, and it will start performances. So Tempestuous Elements, the last performance is March 17th. This, the first performance is March 19th and it runs, I think until about April 20th. Um, but yeah, it's about the contemporary school system. I hope you folks come, lots of people can come. I will tell you that if you look it up, uh, look up, you know, fish, you could say with my name or Keen Company or the Working Theater. Um, through the working theater, they want everybody to be able to see theater to make it accessible, which means there are discount tickets to every oh, performance, wow. but they're limited. So the faster if you want to come, the faster you order it, the cheaper your ticket can be. So, and it'll, it'll be in Midtown in the theater row theaters on 42nd between 9th and 10th. Well, Kia, this was amazing. Thank you for <laughs> spending so much time with us, especially when you have so much going on in, in your life and with your work. Um, congratulations you. on all of the great things that you have done, are doing, and will do in the future. And I want to let the audience know that this recording will be available um, on YouTube. So if you want to rewatch it, if you want to share it with your friends, please feel free to do so. Um, Kia, thank you so much. And, and Miyako, I don't know if you have any closing remarks that you want to make as well. Um, oh, <laughs> no, I was just going to thank you both so much. You can make closing remarks. I'm going to turn it back to you. Thank you all. <laughs> no, 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 I didn't. I have said plenty. So <laughs> my, all the closing remarks is, you know, I hope people can come to fish if they live in New York. And thank you for having me. This was, this was really great. I loved being able to talk about all kinds of things, you know, besides the plays. And yes. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you all so much. We'll send the recording out to your email within a day or so, and it will be on our YouTube channel for you to watch and share with your friends. Thank you so much, and everyone have a great night. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>